<clears throat> excuse me, if you weren't with us last week, we talked a little bit about God's will for our lives and what he wants us to do with our lives and how he expects us to behave and what he, what he has for us and the plan that he has for our lives. And what I wanted to encourage you about is next week we're going to start this series that I think everyone is going to love. While I'm preaching, there's going to be someone painting behind me, and I think it's going to be different than anything that most of you have seen before. I think it would be a great time for you to invite people that may not normally come to church and allow them to see something a little bit different. But this morning, I want to talk to you about digging ditches, because I believe that God has great plans in store for each and every one of us. I believe he has a great plan for your life. I believe he has a great plan for my life. I believe he has great plans for this church. And as I was growing up, I always heard that the way we should live life is we should hope for the best, but expect the worst. And that's such a horrible way to live. It's a horrible thought to think that we're living in this life where we're supposed to hope for the best, but just expect the worst to happen to us. That way we're not disappointed. I don't believe that Jesus died for me to live a life that, that, that is that way. I don't believe that Jesus came to the earth to die for us to live a life that, that it is like that. But what happens is, is there's frustration in our lives because we get to this point because what we expect and what we experience aren't the same thing. So we expect something in our lives to happen, but we experience something totally different, and that's where frustration comes in to our lives. So what do we do with that frustration? And I believe what God is calling us to do is he's calling us to change our expectations and change what we believe and raise it to the experiences he wants us to have. Because all too often what we do is we lower our expectations to meet the experiences we've had. We say, oh, I know what's happened before. I know how I've been let down before. And we begin to lower our expectations in life to things that we've experienced. And I don't believe that that's the way that God wants us to live our lives. If we look at Ephesians 3.20, it says, But to God is the one that can do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine. God has so much more planned for your life than you could ever believe. I want to read to you this morning from 2 Kings chapter 3, and I just want to give you a little bit of a background for our story. These three kings are set out, and they're going to fight this battle that they should have easily been able to win. They should have easily been able to win this battle, and it says this in verse 9. It says, So the kings of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom after a roundabout march of seven Wait, it's green. Try that again. So they've been marching for seven days, and they've run out of water, and they're not really sure what they're going to do, right? And if you've been marching for seven days, you're going to be tired. You're going to be tired. And, and they're wanting to fight, and they're with these men, and they're supposed to So they're there, and they don't have any clue what they're going to do anymore. And they start to realize that they need God. They start to realize that they, they need God. So they're starting to draw out it to God quickly. Because when you run out of the things that you need in your life, that is when you start drawing closer to God. That's when you start to see him more. It's when there is no other hope for your life and you don't know how you're going to get to the things that you need. That's when you start drawing closer to God. And sometimes the best thing that could ever happen to some of us is if we start running out of the things that we know how to do, and all we can do is depend on God. Because we've been doing it on our own for so long that the best thing that could ever happen to us is that the way that we know how, the way that we've always done, it starts to fail us. And all we can do 
is depend on God. So here's what it says in verse 10. What, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? These guys, there had been no mention of God before. There had been no mention of God before. Here they are, they're out in the middle of nowhere, and things start to go wrong, and they blame God. And we see that in our society all the time. We don't call upon God. We don't ask him for his help. But when things start to go wrong, we say, God, why have you left us here? Why have you done this to us? Why have you let me be this way? And this is exactly where they find themselves. They're, they're angry at God because God has let so much bad things happen, and they don't know what they're going to do. Is he just going to let us die? Has he called us out here to fight this war, to leave us alone? What is he going to do with us? We do that in our lives. We say, God, why have you put me in this position? Why are you letting these bosses run me over? Why are you allowing this job to take me down? Why can't I pay my bills anymore, God? Why, God, why? But when something good happens, we say, you know what, God, I did a pretty good job. I did a good job. And we don't really figure it out. But it says this in verse 11, but Jehoshaphat, and I'm not really sure who he was, but I know that he was athletic. Because growing up, people always told me that he liked to jump. But Jehoshaphat, he was the king of the southern kingdom. And he says this, he says, is there no prophet of the Lord here? Through whom we may inquire of the Lord? And an officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And listen, that's an insult. What he's basically saying is he's saying, you know what? He's just a water boy. He never really did anything good. He's just kind of the water boy. But he's here. And Elijah, Elijah, you got to remember, he was like the greatest prophet of their time that they had ever seen. He had done so many great things. He was the man that could call fire down from heaven. And they're saying, you know, here's Elisha. He's poured water on his hands before. Maybe he could do something. And here comes Elisha. And he's about to perform, or he's about to give his first sermon. He's about to say, here's how it goes. And these kings are like, I only need God. What can this man do for me? And I wonder this morning, what need you have in your life? that only God can come through. I wonder what need it is that you have in your life that you realize there is nothing else that you can do anymore, and the only thing that you can do is if God comes through in a miraculous way. Because this is where we find ourselves in this story. This is where these men find themselves. There's nothing else they can do. And I wonder this morning what hurt it is that you're bearing beneath your smile. When people ask you how you're doing and you say, oh, I'm just fine, I wonder what it is that you're hiding underneath that. Now, after you've lived a little while, what you can realize is that there are some things that you can't do, but only God can do. You realize that. Some of us, we've been running around the desert for days and days and days, and we're marching and we're marching, and we start to realize that maybe God's left us out here to die, and we don't know what we're going to do anymore. And we get to this place where all we can do is figure out, hey, I need to call upon God. And it says this in verse 12, Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And now Elijah, he's about to get really great with these people. He's about to really just give it to them. And if you're thinking about being a pastor, you probably shouldn't make what he's about to say your first sermon. It probably wouldn't go over well. So they go to Elijah, and in verse 13 it says, Elisha said to the king of Israel, Why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And he's saying, Lo, now you want my help? Oh, now you've decided to call me. Now you've got yourself in this place. Nobody's been calling me before. But all of a sudden, you want to call me out here. You have no rain, and now you need my help. So he has a little bit of an attitude. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. 
And Elijah, he's about to lose his mind. And he says this, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay attention to any of you. That's not good. That's like, well, you know what? What if I started this morning and said, you know what? If it wasn't for the respect I have for Jennifer, I wouldn't even talk to any of you people. It just wouldn't go over very well. But, I mean, these are the first words that Elijah is saying to these people. He's saying, you know, if it wasn't for, her, for Jehoshaphat, there would be nothing that I had to say to you. But he's about to get there. He's about to give it to him a little bit deeper. He's saying, you know what? I'm about to give you some hope. For some of us, God is the only hope we have left. We realize that there might not be bills we're going to pay this month. We realize that there's sickness in our family, that there's no doctor that can cure. We realize that without God, there is no hope for situations. So Elijah, he gives them this great introductory thought. And he says, I don't want you to miss this. You messed it up. You never involved me sooner. You didn't have to get to this place, but now you call me. And if it were up to me, I'd just leave you hanging out. But here I am, and God wants me to tell you something. And in verse 15, he says this, and it's so great. He says, but now bring me a harpist. Think about this for a moment. Like, Elisha is really high maintenance. They're out there, they're in the middle of nowhere, there's people dying all around him, they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they call upon the man of the Lord, and he says, now bring me a harpist. And that's not the easiest of instruments to get to. It's not the easiest of instruments to carry around. He's asking for like the most hard thing that he could have asked, or he could have asked for a drum, or a cymbal, or just something, but he says, bring me a harpist. I want to have this harpist because he realizes he's about to give them something that they didn't really need. And this isn't, this isn't unnormal. This would happen all the time with prophets. They would bring someone in to play as they're giving their speech, as they're telling them what the God said, because it would put you in a mood. It would enhance the sensitivity to God's, to God's plans, to what God was saying. So this was kind of normal. It's not like when they started playing the music that God started to speak, but it allowed people to draw in and hear him a little more clearly. It's not like God would hear the harp and say, okay, now I can show up. But what would happen is the harp would begin to play and people could sense his presence a little better. Some of that happens when we come to church. We begin and we worship, and it's not like we just start worship at 1030 and that all the worship in the world has begun at that moment. That's not how it works. When we start worshiping at 1030, we are just joining in the worship of the heavenly realms that have been going on since time began. And God is always being worshipped. So here it is, the harvest starts playing, and I don't know if you've ever felt that emotion. If you've ever been to, to church and the music starts to play, and people begin to talk, and they start talking over the music, and you just feel like they're talking deeper into your soul. There are some churches that you go to, and there will be a play person playing the piano the entire time the pastor's preaching. They just play softly in the background, and when they hear him getting a little bit louder, they play a little bit louder, they bring the music up, and that's just what they do. It kind of goes with the mood, and that's what's happening here. And it's kind of like at the end of the service when we give the invitation, the, the, the team comes up and they play because it really allows you to hone in on what God is saying in your life. And wouldn't it just be really cool if every one of us had a harpist to follow us around. Like you get to that place and you're really trying to connect to people and you just turn around and your harpist is there and they're playing behind you. That would be the coolest thing ever. I wish I had one to follow me around. When I got to the really important parts of the sermon, they just started to play. So they're really trying to get in this. Elisha really wants the people to know that he is saying something crazy. He's saying something really deep. It would be great when you're having those moments and you're in your car 
and your kids are about to kill each other in the back seat and the harpist would just start to play. And the kids would just calm down. That's what I need, I think. The peace of God would just fill the car immediately. Or while you're washing dishes or, or doing laundry, the harpist just comes up behind you and just starts to softly play to make all those mundane tasks feel a little bit different. But inspiration is an awesome thing. Inspiration is an awesome thing for our lives. It gets us to move more. It gets us to do more. It gets us to continue to follow those plans for us. Some of us, we get up on Sunday mornings and we're inspired to come to church. We're inspired to get here, to, to do what God wants us to do. And there's some of us that you're so bored right now that you're ready to leave. And that's okay. But some of us, we come to get inspired by God. We come hoping that he inspires us to do something different. He, he's got something for our lives. We, we come hoping that the way that we came in isn't the way that we walk out, that he has something different for us. It's easy to get inspired in a place like this, where we all come together to worship. But it's a little bit different when you're out in the real world and, and the world is coming at you. It's so much different. So while we're here, we can hear God's voice. The music's playing. We've set it up. People have prayed. They've gotten everything that they need in an order together to make sure that you can hear and sense the presence of God. People come early in the morning to practice music. The people write sermons during the week. There's so much that goes on to make Sunday mornings happen so that people can sense and hear the presence of God and get inspired to go out into the world and do something. So we come into church and you say, oh no, I'm going to lead my family to Christ. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to talk to everybody that I know about Jesus. I'm going to change the world. And then when we leave, it kind of the music stops. And we don't know what we're going to do. He's about to give them this word that, he, that they don't want to hear at all. There's this music playing, and the harpist is playing, and the, the hand of the Lord has come upon Elijah. And this is what he says in verse 16. He says, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Now think about this for a second. They've been traveling around for seven days. They're ready to go to war. They're tired. They're thirsty. They're hungry. And he says, I want you to dig a ditch, right? He says, I want you to get out your shovel, and I want you to dig a ditch. And they're like, wait a minute, dude. We're tired. Like, what we really wanted you to come and say, Elisha, was, hey, we've got all the water you need. You can go in there. You can take over those people. And what you're coming to tell me is you want me to work more? And they would have been so confused. They would have been angry. Most of us would have been angry. And if you want the entire message, my entire message this morning summed up in one line, it would be this. Only God can make it rain, but he wants you to dig the ditch. Only God can make it rain, but he wants you to dig the ditch. See, before God sends the rain, he's going to ask you to dig some ditches. And let me tell you, when you start digging ditches, you don't even know where the rain's going to come from. When you start digging ditches, you have no idea how it's going to get there. And sometimes when you put your shovel into the ground, it's frozen. And it doesn't go in very easily. And you try with all your might and you jump on the shovel and you're doing all you can. And the ground is not giving way. But you still have to keep digging. Because only God can send the rain, but he wants you to dig a ditch. So the question this morning is, where does he want you to dig those ditches in your life? Where is he calling you in your life to start digging some ditches? Because listen, in my life, there were people when I was growing up that dug some ditches for me. 
There were people in my life that were digging ditches when I was doing things that I shouldn't have and people were praying for me. There were people that were digging ditches in my life. I remember, well, I don't remember, but when I was born, I was diagnosed with what's called PFC. And what happens is, is when you're, when you're born, your lungs and your heart and everything are fully developed. But for some reason, the child just doesn't want to breathe. So I was born, and I just didn't want to breathe. And they knew what I had, and they, I was born in Lexington, and they said, you know what? There's nothing that we can do for him here at this hospital. So they sent me to another hospital. And here's the crazy thing about PFC is that they don't know what causes it. But they do know that for some reason that when one child has it, more children get it at the same time in the same area. So they send me to another hospital in Lexington, and my dad's the only one with me because my mom had a cesarean, so she's still at the first hospital. And they tell my dad, you know, listen, there's nothing we can do for him. Like, he's just not going to make it. We can, there is a place, we could send him to UK, and they have an experimental drug that they can use, but it's going to cost a whole lot of money, and he probably won't live. And my dad said, you know what, I don't care what it costs. So they sent me to UK, and by the time I was there, there were seven or eight kids that were there in the NICU that had the exact same thing that I did, and they had us all on the exact same experimental drug. So while all this is going on, my grandfather is going to every church in Lexington, and he's having me put on every single prayer list. He's digging some ditches. So while I'm in the NICU and I'm on this experimental drug, there was one child that lived. And that was me. And to this day, the last time I looked, they still don't know what causes it. They still don't have a cure for it. As a matter of fact, the doctor that saved my life had a son about 13 years later that was born with the exact same thing. He named his son Adam after me, and his son passed away. But while I was there, there were people that were digging ditches for me. There were people that were digging ditches and asking God to send the rain. They were doing things to make sure that God had a place to pour out his blessings. Every church had my name on a prayer list. And what God wants you to know this morning is you just can't quit digging. In your life, whatever it is that you're hoping for a breakthrough for, you can't stop digging. You can't stop digging. You have to keep digging. It doesn't matter what you think. You have to keep digging and going after what God has called you to. And this morning, just let me ask you this question. What ditch is God calling you to dig in your life? What area is it? that you know that you need his help with. And some of you, when I ask that question, there is no doubt in your mind exactly where you need God. There's no doubt. For some of you, you might have to think a little bit harder, and, but for some of you, <coughs> excuse me, for some of you, you know exactly what it is. For some of you, you say, you know what, God, I need you to bless my children. God, I need you to draw my kids closer to you. For some of you, you say, God, I'm not going to make it this month. I don't know how we're going to pay all the bills, but God, I need some help. For some of you, you say, man, this job that I'm in, <coughs> I'm not going to make it. I can't do this every single day of my life. I'm so miserable. God, I need you to pour out the rain in my life. Because for most of us, we are real big into that rain thing. We're real big on God pouring the blessings on our life. We're really big on him pouring it out. But none of us want to dig the ditch. He tells us we have to dig the ditch. We say, oh God, you know, I want you to bless my finances. But we don't dig the ditch with our tithes. We hold all those to ourselves. 
He says, why don't you follow my clear instructions? If you want me to bless you, why don't you do what I've told you to do? And you say, but God, I don't understand your instructions. I don't understand why you'd want me to do that. And God says, I don't call you to fully understand. What I call you to do is to obey. That's how we get in trouble. Like if you think about it, that's how we get in trouble in our lives is when we quit obeying God. God starts calling us. He wants us to do stuff. And we try to wait until we can fully understand the why. But that's not faith. When we have true faith, we have to follow God to all the places that he's called us to do, whether we understand it or not. Because it doesn't make sense to dig, val- to dig ditches in a valley when there's drought in the land. I mean, none of that made any sense. Why would you want me to dig a ditch? We're in the middle of a drought. Me digging a ditch isn't going to change anything. But that's exactly what God called them to do. He said, you got to dig that ditch. you got to get out there. you got to dig deeper. And it sounded crazy. But that's where real faith comes in. And there are things in your life that God has called you to do, and you hear him, and you know, and you're like, that is insane. And you pray, and you say, God, if you really want me to do this, you need to tell me to do it. I really need to understand you here, God. I can't do it unless you understand, I understand the why and why you want me to do it. Everything behind it, and God says, I just told you to obey me. And I think it's an amazing thing that God wants us to partner with him. He wants us to dig the ditch. He wants us to do that. And so many of the people in this church come every week and they do things early and they volunteer and you step outside of yourself and you're digging ditches so that people can come to know Jesus. That's an amazing thing. People talk about God and they say, you know, God, I need your joy. God says, if you want my joy, then what you need to do is rejoice. And God says, and you people say, well, God, just send me joy. He says, I'll send you more joy when you start rejoicing. One of my favorite questions is this, well, how was church today? People say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Since when was church about what we're supposed to get out of it? And not about how God, how God, we're here to praise God who is supposed to be praised. To give him all of our praises. To praise him for everything that he's done in our life. For everything that he's going to do. And admire him for all of that. We come to church and... We don't really pay attention or we don't really worship him. We don't get into it and we expect something in us to change when we're not giving him any of ourselves. Or as Elijah said, if you want God to send the rain, then you got to dig the ditch. If you want God to change your life, then you got to dig the ditch. If you're, if you're single and you're, and you're wanting to find the right person, maybe what you need to do is just be the right person. Or maybe if you're someone and you're frustrated with your job and you say, God, why won't you just give me a better job? Why won't you just give me a better job? And he says, well, you know what? You just got to keep digging those ditches you got to keep working harder in the place that you are right now, showing me how faithful that you can be there, doing a good job, doing everything that you do as unto me if you want me to give you something else. Because we know that he has already been faithful in the past. Most of us can talk about stories in our lives where God has been so faithful. So what ditches does he want you to dig? Some of you, you've, you've given up on digging because you thought it wasn't working. 
You've been digging for year after year after year. You've been doing the same thing. You've been praying for those family members that don't know Jesus year and day after day after day for years. You've given up. You just don't think that what you've been doing is working. But don't give up. God tells us that nothing is impossible with him. It says this, it says in, in the verse of reading, it says, For this is what the Lord says, you will neither, you'll see neither wind nor rain. I think what we often wait to do for God is we just keep waiting for the rain clouds to come in. We keep waiting to see the blessing coming. We keep waiting to see how it's going to get there. We keep waiting to see just the slightest inkling of God on the move. What we need to do is quit waiting on a sign from God and get started digging. Get started digging those ditches. Don't wait to see evidence because for the most time, for the most part, our evidence comes after you started. Because the Lord says you won't see the rain, you won't feel the wind, but yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. You will, you will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every great good tree, stop up all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. In other words, you're about to win. When we realize that the Lord is the light of our salvation, there is nothing that we should fear. God's telling you, if you start to dig a ditch, if you get to work on the things that he's called you to, he is about to send the rain and you are about to overcome everything that's in your way. And that's an amazingly powerful testimony from God. But for some reason, we don't hold on to that all the time. It says this in verse 20, the next morning about the time for offering the sacrifice, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom. And the land was filled with water. Will you stand with me this morning? Some of you, what you need to realize is that you are about to be blessed in a miraculous ways by God if you can get out your shovel and you start digging the ditch. And see, when I grew up and I heard this story, I always thought that when they dug the ditches that they immediately started to fill with, God or with water, that God immediately sent the rain. What you realize if you read the story carefully is it didn't come immediately. It was the next morning that those blessings were prepared. And sometimes we have to wait till the next day. We have to wait until God sends us what we need. And it's not going to be admitted immediately. See, God sees things that you don't see. God sees your tomorrow. And it's an amazing thing. If you dig those ditches, he says, I'll bring your kids back. If you dig those ditches, I won't let your company go under. If you dig those ditches, I won't let you go under. If you dig those ditches, I will walk right with you. So this morning, maybe the question you need to answer is, what ditches do I need to dig? In my life, what ditches do I need to dig so that God can pour out his blessings upon me? What is it that I need to do? And for some of you this morning, what you need to do, the, the first ditch that you, you need to dig in your life is this morning you're realizing that you don't know Jesus and you're feeling led to accept him as your Lord and Savior. And here in just a moment, they're going to start to play and I'm going to come down and I'm going to invite you, if that's you this morning, and you realize that the first ditch that you need to dig is to allow him to be your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to come down and just meet with me here at the foot of the stairs. And for some of you, there are other things that God is showing you and he's illuminating to your heart at this very moment. 
There are things that he might have been talking to you about for years that don't make any sense that you've never believed that God could have called you to. And this morning he's telling you, start digging those ditches. So what is it he's called you to this morning? Let's pray together. And after I pray, if you feel led to come and just allow God and accept him as your Lord and Savior, I'll meet you at the bottom of these stairs. Father, we thank you for today. Father, I thank you that you still speak to hearts. Father, I thank you that you still love us enough to never let us go. Jesus, this morning, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done and all that you are about to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.